Beginners love to pick the longsword because it's such an iconic weapon. It's the signature weapon of the Monster Hunter series, and it being a katana, it's the signature weapon of Japanese culture. Capcom went to great lengths to make the moveset mimic those used in reality, as well as to mimic the crazy superhuman moves of legend. Since most people are gonna start the game by choosing the longsword, I'm gonna give you this word of warning. Longsword is the type of weapon that will allow you to play very, very poorly without giving you any indication that you're doing anything wrong. The second warning I have for you, the best combos for the longsword are not the most obvious ones. The upside to this is there's always new techniques to discover so it can be very rewarding to play the longsword over the long term. When you're playing the longsword, there's one weapon mechanic that is critical to your success and that you need to understand in order to do enough damage. That's the charge level. Certain finishing moves will raise your sword's charge level from nothing to white to yellow and finally red. Your charge level will go down over time or when you perform certain other moves. Since your charge level determines how much damage your attacks will do, most of the gameplay and combos are designed around raising your charge level, discharging it, and then raising it back up again. Keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the tutorial, and you'll understand why certain moves are so powerful and useful for playing the weapon at a high level. One other thing to keep in mind as we go through this tutorial, there are a lot of different attacks and an infinite number of ways to chain them into combos. This tutorial can be overwhelming if you try to take it all in at once. So take your time going through this, watch it as many times as you need to in order to get the information you need out of it. Now, just because Longsword has a lot of moves, that doesn't mean you need to know very much about the weapon to play at a high level. In fact, you can do amazing things with just three moves. I'll tell you which ones they are as we go along so you know what to master first. You can layer in all the other moves into your repertoire just a little bit at a time as you go along. The game's gonna start you out with two switch skills. The first is Soaring Kick. This is the first important move that you need to learn. This move shoots a wire bug at the monster, drawing you up toward the monster. If you hit the monster, you'll do a small attack, and then you'll be able to follow it up with two aerial moves. After you do the soaring kick, if you don't press any buttons, you'll do the plunging thrust. Now, if you do have a charge on your weapon, you can hold down the shoulder button as you go, and instead of a plunging thrust, you'll do a very big move, the Spirit Helmbreaker. The plunging thrust does multiple hits, and the Helmbreaker does even more hits. The amount of damage that your Helmbreaker does depends on your weapon's charge level. So it's always best to do Helmbreakers when you have a red charge level on your weapon. So plunging thrust may not seem very appealing when compared to a helm breaker, but it does have one advantage that the helm breaker doesn't. A plunging thrust will give you automatic regeneration of your spirit gauge. That's the white bar running right down the middle of your sword. So you'll see that white bar turn blue. That means automatic regeneration. It's going to give you quite a bit of spirit gauge, in fact, and then it's going to turn on gauge regeneration. So there's a couple things you need to know before we get started with the moves. If you look up in the top left corner of your screen, you will see a picture of a katana. And the katana has a colored outline. It's either going to be no outline or a white outline. 
yellow, or red. Those are the different charge levels on your weapon. Certain moves that you do will raise that charge level from white to yellow and yellow to red. There's one other part of that katana that's important, and that's that white line right down the middle of it. You see, that line gets used up when you do perform certain attacks. It increases when you perform certain other attacks. So some attacks will fill that gauge, it's called the spirit gauge, and some attacks, specifically the spirit combo maneuvers, will use up that gauge. So the idea is to fill up the gauge, perform spirit combos to use it. Now there's a lot of different mechanisms that you have for filling the gauge, for turning on auto regen. For example, this plunging thrust move will turn on auto regen. See the gauge turns blue and starts filling up automatically. It's very useful. There's another move we'll get to real soon that does the same thing. It starts auto filling your gauge for you. Notice the red outline is ticking down pretty slowly, but it's still draining. Once that red outline drains, we're going to lose our red charge level and go to yellow. And then yellow will start ticking down. So it's very important to keep your charge level high. You want that outline to be red as much as possible because that means you're going to get a much bigger damage multiplier to all your attacks. So the Spirit Helmbreaker uses up one of your charge levels. When I do it, it takes you from red to yellow, from yellow to white, and from white down to nothing. And notice the damage numbers get much smaller each time. It's really hard to talk about one aspect of Longsword without talking about the other aspects of Longsword because everything is so interconnected. So the first switch skill you get is the Soaring Kick. It leads into two nice follow-ups, the Plunging Thrust and the Helm Breaker. The other switch skill you start out with is called Serene Pose. This is a counter. If it's successful, this will lower the charge level on your sword as well. The nice thing about this counter is it is near instantaneous. So when an attack's coming in, you simply press the button. If the attack hits you, you will do a very big counter attack. The number is bigger, the higher your charge level. Now, Serene Pose is triggered when an attack hits your character, not when it hits the wire bug mesh around your character. So you gotta be very careful with your positioning. The nice thing is, it doesn't matter which direction the attack comes from, it will still trigger the counter. Not only is this counter nice to use when you want a big damage move, but it's also a nice move that can save your ass when an attack is coming in faster than you can react. And you have no other option, just hit this count, hit Serene Pose. Instead of taking damage, you'll deal damage. If you do Serene Pose and you don't get hit, that means you don't trigger the counter, your character's just gonna stand there. Now, they'll stand there for a couple seconds waiting for an attack to come in. If no attack hits you, then you're gonna stand there for another second after that where you can't do anything and you're not protected. So you're vulnerable for an entire second. So be very careful with your positioning on this move. Make sure that you are going to get hit so that counter triggers and you don't take damage. Right from the start, Longsword has a special move called Special Sheath. This is the second important move that you need to learn in order to master Longsword. Special Sheath is one of those moves that you can perform after almost any other move in the game. You can perform it right after a serene pose. You can perform it after a plunging thrust. And you can even perform it after a helm breaker. Now you can't just go straight into a special sheath. You have to perform it after an attack. Okay, so you can do a quick thrust and then go to special sheath. And what it does is it puts you in this, this little ready stance, like the samurai of old, waiting 
to do a quick draw of your sword. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to do one of two follow-up moves. You get into your special sheath stance and you can perform an Yai Slash, which is simply this. This is a two hit combo. And the Yai Slash also turns on regeneration of your spirit gauge. You're going to be doing Yai Slash very frequently in this game. The other draw attack you have is called the Yai Spirit Slash. And this is an amazing counter. And it's a fundamental move that you need to learn. This is the probably the most powerful counter in the game. It does several things. First thing, since it's a counter, it's going to nullify the incoming attack. Secondly, if you hit the monster after performing the counter, it's going to do multiple hits. And these hits, if they're on a weak spot, are very high damage. And then third, if you do successfully hit this counter, you can go into another special sheath and get ready to counter another incoming attack or simply continue your combo chain. So special sheath is a fundamental move for you to learn. Why would I wanna do a Yai Slash when the Yai Spirit Slash is so powerful? Sometimes the monster is not going to just walk right into your counter. He's either standing there or attacking in a different direction or shaking himself off. He's not ready to attack you. So if you did a Yai Spirit Slash, you wouldn't trigger the counter. And so the move is wasted. So if you get into the ready pose and an attack is not imminent, you can simply do a Yai Slash and continue to charge up your sword the conventional way. When choosing a longsword, you'll also start the game with a special evade maneuver. And this special evade is called Foresight Slash. Foresight Slash is the third important move that you need to learn in order to master longsword. And with these three moves, the special sheath with the Yai Spirit Slash, Foresight Slash, and the Soaring Kick, with just those three moves alone, you can dominate any monster. You don't need any other moves in order to play longsword at a high level. So what Foresight Slash does is, it's kind of like a counter, but it's not. It works like a counter, but technically it's not a counter. It's a, it's a special attack that has its own evade built into it. Check this out. When an attack is coming in, when you press the Foresight Slash button, it's going to throw you backward. It's going to evade you backward, and that evade has insane iframes on it. You can Foresight Slash the evade part through just about any attack in the game. If you successfully evade on that first half of the Foresight Slash move, and then you pull back in, if your blade connects with the monster, it will fill your spirit gauge completely with one attack. Watch this. So my spirit gauge is completely empty. I'm at a white charge level. Successful foresight slash fills my spirit gauge completely with one attack. It's amazing. Another nice thing about foresight slash is you don't have to finish this move you can interrupt it halfway through. So you can take advantage of the iframes on the first half, the evasion portion of it, and then you can chain into other attacks, like, for example, a soaring kick. Let's see what that looks like. So it is interruptible. You can even interrupt it with a special sheath. So there is one downside to foresight slash. Let's say you have some spirit gauge built up and you successfully evade but you miss the monster, you're going to lose your entire spirit gauge. When you foresight slash, make sure you're in position to hit the monster so you don't lose your spirit gauge. As soon as you do the foresight slash, you lose your spirit gauge. So the only way to get all of your spirit gauge back is to actually hit the monster on the return stroke, as it were. The next thing that you get right from the start is a special combo. This is called the Spirit Combo. It's a series of three attacks and a finisher that require Spirit Gauge to perform, 
but if you hit that finisher, it's going to raise the charge level on your weapon. Let's take a look at what that looks like. To get started with this, you're going to need more than half of your spirit gauge filled. So when you have close to full spirit gauge, you're gonna pull the trigger, you're gonna do a spirit blade one, a spirit blade two, the spirit blade three is three attacks, and then finally, the finisher, the spirit round slash. This is what you get right from the start. And it's a nice way to raise your charge level when you can't get a counter off. It's always there for you, whether the monster is disabled or not. One, two, three hits on the third, and then your finisher. Notice you'll sheathe your weapon after the finisher. If you don't want to sheathe it that way, you can sheathe it with a special sheath instead. The regular sheath is going to happen automatically. If you want to go into a special sheath, after your finisher, you have to press the special sheath button like this. And then you can just start another combo. Now, my sword is charged up to red, so I don't need to hit my spirit combo finisher anymore. It's not gonna do me much good. It'll do damage, so if it's the only attack I have available, sure, I can use it. But it's not going to raise my power any higher. It will refill the red, as you see right there, which can be good if you're almost down to yellow. Now, you don't need a full spirit gauge in order to do this combo, because in between the spirit slashes, you can insert these little attacks to raise your gauge just a little bit. I can start from no spirit gauge and get my finisher. So let's see if I can do this. I can do the step slash, the overhead slash, the thrust, start my combo, insert, combo, insert, next combo, and the finisher. There are the big cool moves that Longsword gives you from the start. Let's step back a little bit and take a look at your basic moves. You've seen several of these already. First is the step slash. It is a draw attack. Run at the monster, draw your weapon, and you've got a step slash. It's a pretty big hit, it's a basic hit, it's an overhead hit, it's got a very high reach up high as well. You can follow this up with an overhead slash. So it's like two overhead slashes, one right after another. And they're great for filling your spirit gauge, as we just demonstrated. If you just keep spamming the B button, you're going to do thrust rising slash combo. It's like a quick combo. It doesn't quite do the most damage, but it's a really quick combo. You can fill your gauge up just by doing that combo. So the other combo is the Y button, overhead, thrust, rising, overhead, thrust, rising. So it's three different attacks. And you could fill your gauge pretty quickly with that combo too. These, these two combos are designed to fill your spirit gauge. The thrust or the overhead move can also be used to enable you to perform the foresight slash, which you can't do from a standstill, or a special sheath, which you can't do from a standstill. So we've got another basic move, which isn't really that basic. It goes back a long way in the series. It's called the fade slash, and that is just both attack buttons together. Now you can fade slash from a standstill, which is nice, but you can only go backwards with it. If you do a attack first, you can fade slash to the left, fade slash to the right. It's a nice way to reposition, and the fade slash can be followed up by the spirit step slash. If you wanna charge your gauge real quickly, another way to do it would be overhead, overhead, thrust, fade, spirit step, and then you can go straight to a spirit blade three, and then your finisher. The fade slash is a pretty nice move on its own. Combine it with the spirit step slash, you can replace the first two moves in your spirit combo. You can replace the spirit blade one and the spirit blade two. 
So it's a nice way to quickly get to your finisher. Overhead, overhead, fade, step, spirit three, finisher. See, I don't have to charge my gauge up that much because I'm only doing two of the four spirit attacks, which use your gauge instead of, for example, doing spirit one, two, three, and now I don't have enough for the finisher now. Some more basic moves you can attack from wire bug. So you have your jumping spirit blade. You can do it from a hanging wire bug. There's two variations on this jumping spirit blade. One of them does three hits and one of them does only one hit. Let's take a closer look at that. Well, if you have a red charge, it's gonna do three hits. If you're way up in the air, you're gonna do a multi-hit attack. If you wait just a little bit longer, you can do a single hit down low. And the one I like the most, the hanging wire bug, just for style points. Now you don't have to use the spirit blade. You can just do a simple jumping slash. It's kind of like an overhead slash. That's fine too. Wire bug, draw your weapon, and you do a jumping slash. There's just so many freaking options. It's just ridiculous how many different combos there are. The funnest part for me about playing Longsword is just trying out all the new ways to chain these attacks together and to create something clever. Okay, so that is what you get right from the start, all of that. And if you didn't get anything else for the rest of the entire game, that is more than enough. The three most powerful, most important moves you get right from the start. But you are going to get a couple, you're going to get three more moves as the game progresses. The first new move you're going to get is after you defeat the Three Star Village Urgent Quest. It's going to unlock the Sakura Slash. Sakura Slash is opposite the Soaring Kick. So if you enable Sakura Slash, you're giving up your Soaring Kick, you're giving up your Plunging Thrust, and you're giving up your Helmbreaker. That's a lot to give up. And a lot of people don't want to give all that up because those moves are pretty cool and pretty powerful. But Sakura Slash is pretty powerful in its own right because Sakura Slash is an easy way to raise your charge levels very quickly. Performing one Sakura Slash will instantly raise your charge level by one. When you switch from Soaring Kick to Sakura Slash, you're shifting your play style in the opposite direction. Soaring Kick Helmbreaker combo lowers your charge level by one. Successfully using a Sakura Slash raises it by one. It's more of a building up move than a tearing down move. Sakura Slash and Soaring Kick lead to two opposing play styles. Soaring Kick spends your charge levels and then you have to gain them back again. With Sakura Slash, the idea is to get up to red charge level and to stay there. In fact, the only way for you to spend your charge levels, if you're using soccer slashes, is to use the Serene Pose. And that's really not a bad idea at all. Soccer Slash is high damage, Serene Pose is ridiculously high damage. When you play Sakura style, you're going to have a red gauge almost all the time, and so all your hits are going to be for maximum damage. You can take advantage of a lot of those other moves that we talked about, and you can ensure that they're all always going to hit at their highest power. I would say on the whole, Sakura is underrated because most people gravitate toward the Soaring Kick Helmbreaker. They do that because they want to see the big numbers and, um, you know, people tell them, yeah, Helmbreaker is the best thing in the game. And well, yeah, the numbers are really high, but it takes a special play style in order to continually get your charge level up to red so that you can do another Helmbreaker, lower your charge level, figure out how to get it back up to red. Sakura is, I would say, maybe a, a little less anxiety-inducing playstyle, and it's just as potent of a playstyle as Soaring Kick Helmbreaker. So don't just dismiss it without trying it first. Sakura requires a bit of aim to get just right, and you want to aim it so that you're getting two hits. You want to hit the target twice. You hit it once, you'll get your follow-up hits. Okay, that's fine. If you aim it properly, you'll get two hits and 
twice the follow-ups like that. You want to make sure both those hits are hitting your weak spot and you're not doing something like this, where one of them hits a little suboptimally like that. Those are actually both pretty good. <laughs> so if you're too far away, you might not get both hits like that. If you're too close, well, I got lucky that time. <laughs> so yeah, if you're too close, you might only get one hit. If your angle is just a little off, you might not hit where you want to. I'm actually, I'm trying to mess it up and I can't. That's, that's kind of funny. About an hour ago, I was missing everything. So maybe I'm just naturally getting better at this. <laughs> there we go. Two not so great hits right there. Cool thing about Sakura Slash, it's actually a lot like doing a spirit combo, but all in one move. It's like spend a wire bug and do a spirit combo. Because if you hit successfully, you're going to raise your charge level and you're going to automatically sheath your weapon. And the cool thing about Sakura Slash, since you have that auto sheath, yes, you can interrupt the auto sheath and do a special sheath. Optimally, you'll go past him. You don't want to just special sheath like this, you're facing the wrong way. So when you do that special sheath, make sure you push in a direction, meaning backwards. It turns you around, special sheaths, and gets you ready to continue the assault. So soccer is a great way to raise your charge level quickly. It takes a wire bug to use it. You can't just spam Sakura over and over again. Likewise, you can't spam Soaring Kick Helmbreaker over and over again. Soaring Kick takes a wire bug. I want to do three Sakura slashes as fast as I can. There's one. So the wire bug's regening already. I got my second one off, and it's going to take a while for that to regen. I would be at yellow strength right now, and that's okay because I have other options to raise my charge level again. I can use my spirit combo like this. I can do a special sheath and do a Yai spirit slash counter, or I can do some foresight action, foresight to get that final charge level. The next move you're going to get is after you craft or upgrade your longsword eight times, crafting a new longsword or upgrading an existing longsword, you do that a total of eight times, you're going to get the drawn double slash. What this does is it replaces the step slash, and it replaces the single overhead step slash draw attack with two attacks every time you draw your weapon. You can chain that nicely into a spirit combo. Now see, you get so much spirit gauge built up from the draw and double slash. So it's more damage on your draw attack. There is a downside though. You get more damage and more gauge. However, there are two moves that you cannot follow the draw and double slash with. The first one is the overhead slash. If you try to follow it with an overhead slash, you're going to do a thrust instead. Let's take a look at that again. Drawn double, press what I thought was going to be an overhead slash, and it does a thrust. Okay, so the step slash, if you remember, you do the, the step slash draw attack, and you can follow it with an overhead slash right afterwards. You cannot do that with the drawn double. The other thing you can't do after the drawn double is a fade slash. Let's check this out. Overhead, I'm trying to fade. It's not going to work. It's just going to do a thrust. And then I can do a fade. It's a subtle difference, but be aware of it. If you have a combo chain that you're used to with the step slash, and it involves step slash, overhead slash, and then you switch over to the drawn double, and you want to continue that combo chain just by muscle memory, you're going to have a bad time. Here's the step slash. You can follow it with an overhead. Cannot do that with drawn double. Here's the other one. Step slash, fade slash. Can't do that with the drawn double. You got to get a thrust in there first. Not a major difference, but just be aware of it because if your weapon works, starts working differently than you're used to, that's probably why. The last move that you're going to learn, it's a high rank six star hub quest called Learn the Longsword. This is going to unlock the spirit reckoning combo. What this does is it changes the end of your spirit combo. It changes that round slash to a different type of finisher. Let's take a look at what it actually does. Spirit reckoning combo. Spirit blade one, spirit blade two. Instead of the spirit blade three, you do a dividing slash and then you get a spirit reckoning finisher. 
It's not a one, two, three round slash. It's a one, two, dividing slash, and then reckoning finisher. It's a two hit finisher and notice it does not automatically sheath your weapon. You can do a special sheath right afterwards, which is what I almost always do automatically. You can't do a foresight slash. You can't do a soaring kick or Sakura. The best option is the special sheath at the end. Now the dividing slash is different from the Spirit Blade 3. The Spirit Blade 3 is a triple hit and then you get the round slash finisher. That's, so that's a total of four hits in the end. With the reckoning combo, you've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so it's one less hit, but it's a different movement pattern. Let's take a look at what dividing slash really looks like when I'm not right up in this guy's face. So if we just stand here and go one, two, dividing slash doesn't move, all right? It's just a single step. Watch what happens when we press a direction with dividing slash. I just pressed forward and dividing slash can really move you across the screen. So if you start your combo and the monsters maybe move back a little bit, you can cover some ground and get a little closer to them. So that's the final move that you learn. There's way too much information. I don't want to overwhelm you with tons and tons of different combos. You've got more than enough attacks outlined here to get you to an elite level of play. It's going to require a lot of practice because longsword requires a lot of timing and a lot of split second decision making. You can't just go out there and start hack and slashing and expect to do a decent enough damage output. So take the time to really learn these key moves and you will feel as awesome playing this weapon as it looks like you should feel when you really see that high level play. The process of creating your own combos and chaining moves together I'm going to leave that up to you to experiment with. And like every other weapon, there's always the question, which longsword do I pick? What's the best longsword to use in the game? And my answer is always the same thing. Every longsword has its place. You can perform extremely well no matter which weapon you choose. So if you're the type of person who needs me to tell you which weapon to use, I'm going to put three of them out there for you to consider. Most people will recommend the following three longswords, the Nargakuga longsword, the Tigrex longsword, and the Camellios longsword. Over the long run, they all work equally well. The Nargakuga has great sharpness, so it's a lot lower maintenance. You don't have to worry so much about sharpness management. You can start along the ore tree, and then once you get Nargakuga opened up, you can upgrade to that. The Camellios sword comes a lot later in the game, and so you're not going to get that right away. This one has a lot higher damage, but it requires a lot more sharpness maintenance. So it just comes down to how lazy are you? Are you the type of person who doesn't like to sharpen a lot? Go with the Narg Sword. If you're the type of person who, yeah, you just love to sharpen every 30 attacks or so, Camellios is the way to go. The third weapon, Tigrex Longsword. This one is really nice. Because there's a way you can get a special skill on it called Silkbind Boost. You're going to start with the Ore Tree, and you're going to keep upgrading it until you get Keen Edge 1 Sword. When you get the Keen Edge 1 Sword, and you unlock the ability to assign Rampage skills to your weapons, you're going to go to Ramp Up, and you're going to put Silkbind Boost on Keen Edge 1. And then you're going to keep that Rampage skill on it. When you upgrade your Keen Edge 1 to Tigrex, when you unlock Tigrex and have the ability to upgrade it to Tigrex, do not change the Rampage skill. Okay, Tigrex Sword doesn't have the ability to put Silkbind Boost on it. But if you upgrade to Tigrex from the Keen Edge that already has Silkbind Boost on it, now you have a Tigrex Sword with Silkbind Boost. And the cool thing about this is Tigrex is a high damage sword and when you have silk bind boost on it you're going to get a massive damage bonus to all your silk bind attacks and so people who like to play the helmbreaker style they will do this little trick 
and it will boost their Helmbreaker damage by a ridiculous amount, like 15% or something. It's crazy. So that's a nice little trick for you to use to try out because it's cool. It's fun. All the cool kids are doing it. But you don't have to worry about that right now. Just keep in mind, get to Keen Edge 1, and when you can, ramp it up with Silkbind Boost. Then consider upgrading it to Tigrex. Personally, I like the Narga Kuga Sword because I don't like to have to sharpen all the time. And I love that high affinity on it. Armor skills to consider. For Longsword, the number one most important skill is Quick Sheath 3. Can you play without Quick Sheath 3? Absolutely. Just learn the timings and the special sheath takes a little bit longer to use. But let me show you what it looks like with Quick Sheath 3. And you can see side by side how much faster it is. The nice thing about Quick Sheath is it makes your special sheath so much faster. And since special sheath is a big part of all play styles. The quick sheath makes the animation so much faster that you can respond much more quickly with the Yai Spirit Slash counter. You can do a Yai Spirit Slash almost as fast as you can do a Foresight Slash. Another nice armor skill, Wirebug Whisperer 3. If you're playing the Sakura Slash Serene Pose play style, Wirebug Whisperer 3 is great because it's going to give you a quicker cooldown on your wirebugs. So the, your wirebugs will regenerate faster and you'll have access to them more quickly for more Sakuras and more Serene poses. That is a wirebug heavy playstyle. So Wirebug Whisperer 3, definitely a great skill for that. If you're the type of guy who loves to flip around on the screen, long distance attacks, in and out, long range, Evade Extender is crazy for long sword try it out it's pretty awesome do you need a vedic sender no it adds a whole nother dimension to the combos the attacks are so long range already a vedic extender just amps it up when it becomes available handicraft is a great skill to have because it's going to unlock white sharpness on a lot of the weapons and the white sharpness is a higher damage multiplier Master's Touch, Protective Polish, Speed Sharpening, these are all great skills to have for sharpness management. And like every other weapon, Critical Boost and Weakness Exploit, great skills to have. Another interesting skill for Longsword is Mind's Eye. This skill allows you to attack the tough spots, the hard spots on a monster, the ones that don't do a lot of damage. And in fact, a lot of your attacks will bounce off those spots because they're so hard. With Mind's Eye, you will not bounce off the monster at all. It's great for certain matchups where mon certain monsters have really, really tough spots. And it's great if you're trying to get part breaks on those really tough spots that you would otherwise bounce off of. All right, so you've got all the moves you need. You've got your armor skills. You've got your weapon picked out. What do you do now? Where do you attack the monster? As you've seen in the demonstrations of the moves that I've been doing, I've been trying to focus on the head. And that's because the head is almost always the weakest part of any monster. It's not always, but it's almost always. So you can look up in your large monster notes and for every monster that you've fought, it's going to show you the weakest part of that monster. You want to look at the sword column and for the particular monster you're going up against, find the biggest number and attack that spot. Now the nice thing about longsword is that it has such really long distance attacks. And so reaching any part of the monster that you need to is relatively easy to do. So if you want to hit the tail, if that's the weak spot, the tail's wide open, the head's wide open from almost anywhere you're at. Legs are usually weak enough, not always the weakest spot, but they're usually a pretty weak spot. And with longsword, especially attacking the legs results in a lot of trips. So the monster falls down. That allows you to use a lot of follow-up attacks to really punish the weakest spot, whether it's the head or the tail, or to even access other spots for part breaks like wings or back. And finally, the most important skill for you to learn, reading the monsters. Know where the monsters are going to be and plan your attacks to anticipate that. 
directionality is very important with longsword because many of its moves make you travel much further than other weapons do. So make sure you're facing in the right direction so that your follow-up attacks end up going where you want them to. A lot of the attacks with longsword allow you to change direction as you're performing them. For example, the special sheath. This is gonna be one of the longest tutorials that I make. I could make a four hour long longsword tutorial and it still wouldn't cover everything. Now, since this is a beginner's guide, I don't want to overwhelm you with the infinity of combos available. You're gonna discover your own favorites as you experiment with the weapon. Throughout all the hours that I've put into the weapon, I've discovered a bunch of combos that I like and I made a video about my top five favorite longsword combos. I want you to check that one out too, and you can get an idea of how deep this weapon really gets. And the other thing I'd like you to do is to subscribe to the channel. If you are an expert longsword player, I want you to leave a comment with tips that you have for beginners and even tips for people looking for more advanced techniques. Leave a comment on anything that I got wrong or anything you think I left out that should be in here. Any additional info that you think would be helpful. And don't forget to like the video. I'll see you guys in the next tutorial.